So we're starting the recording. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to take a few um, minutes, just let more people come in. Um, and in that time, we're going to just show a bit of student work on topics related to this. So let me share my screen. Oh, the dean just texted. Okay, let me share my screen. So we'll just wait a few um, minutes, let some more people come in. Um, Oh, uh, Sid, can you uh, let people in from the waiting room? I don't, I can't see that right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, so we're just gonna show, while we wait for more people to come in, uh, we're just gonna show uh, some student work that relates. Uh, you can see uh, the GIF showing uh, a lot of the different images. Uh, this is Sierra and CJ. Um, you can read a brief description over there and um, a question in the bottom left that arise from their work. Um, So hi everyone coming in. Uh, we're just waiting a little bit to let um, more people come in and in the meantime, showing a bit of student work. So this one was uh, Cam and Baron. Uh, This question I thought was like pretty interesting. Just um, noting the relevance of um, landmarks to uh, the empowerment of different communities. Um, the project was beautiful. This one is Sid's in Nangi in Jade. Um, and I'll just uh, let these people know. Um, so we're just waiting a few extra minutes, letting people come in and showing some of the student work related. So we're gonna wait like two more minutes and just start at 08. Um, and show these last few projects.
All right, um, I think we can get started. So, hi everyone. Thank you uh, for coming. I want to start with just a land acknowledgement. Um, so land acknowledgements bring attention to the original inhabitants of the land we dis live on, design, and often prescribe about. Um, if you're here, you've probably heard them before, and hopefully you know um, the land of which you're currently on, but if not, and you're in the United States mostly, um, or I think most of the, uh, yeah, the Americas, you can see um, where, who was the original inhabitants. Um, and acknowledging the land is very important, but the time for simple acknowledgement is far from past. Often acknowledgements give feelings of resolution and, and absolvement, which can be detrimental to the goal. So then what am I calling for? I'm calling for an acknowledgement of the issues that breathe the situation that many indigenous people find themselves in today. It's an acknowledgement of the capitalist, individualist, exploitive and extractive ideologies that have placed all of us here, but particularly indigenous people here today. It is facing the fact that without addressing these issues, land acknowledgements in any form of aid is a mute point. We cannot turn a blind eye to the acts that brought us where we are today. Acknowledging the influence that institutions and pedagogies have over us is of utmost importance. And to properly acknowledge the land indigenous people are on and we're on means to challenge all of these systems. And naturally, as designers and thinkers, our first thought tends to be, well, what can I do about this? And how can I resolve this issue? We often want actionable steps. In conversation with the Lenape Center a few weeks ago, some of these questions were posed and their response was pretty intuitive yet often overlooked by many of us. The first thing you should do is to reach out to the original inhabitants of the land. Often there will be a local center for you to talk to. For me in Brooklyn, that was the Lenape Center, Lenape center and the Lenape people there. Um, and their advice to me was to do what we do best, design. Many of us have learned so much and have so much natural creative thought. This is something we need to apply towards working toward for our collective goal. Many centers would love for you to simply contact them with ideas and would work with you to a mutually beneficial outcome. But it's important to come into these conversations from an open standpoint as there is so much knowledge that we have not learned or been exposed to that can reshape our ideas, designs, and futures. Do not enter these conversations from the perspective of getting a sign of approval for what you want to do. This is the very exploitive and extractive ideologies we must be fighting to reach our common goal. So to this point, at the beginning, I said, land acknowledgements could be detrimental to the goal, but what is the goal? Obviously in this situation, the movement of land back comes to mind, but as people who do not think of the land to be owned, the idea of simply giving land back and deserting is not the intention. The amount of destruction, waste, and displacement would not align with the values many, at least the Lenape Center, uh, believe in. What we need to do is work to give Indigenous people their voice and agency within governing spaces back. Not because of a vindictiveness or anger or hatred, but because it's not only right, but the Lenape Center believes that the values and beliefs they can bring to the land will benefit all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our role in this is to first pressure um, who we can um, to work with the original inhabitants of the land. Then the goal is a return of agency, a redaction of the extractive and exploitive ideologies that breed destruction, the construction of a path towards mutual growth for all of us, whether fighting for reparations, land back, fighting ICE, fighting in immigration sanctions and all other land-based movements to work in solidarity construct to construct a world that values beauty, generosity, relations, and community above all. So contact your local centers, 
and do what you do best, design. Design programs, buildings, workplaces, design pedagogies, and design all of them in collaborate collaboration with the people whose land you are on and are designing on. Only through those collaboration, solidarity, and taking action against these systems can we properly acknowledge the land we live on and its original inhabitants. Um, so uh, with that call to action, I want to move towards this event. Um, hello, everyone that's been coming in. Um, I hope everyone's having a good day. I want to get quickly into this event and not take much more time in the intro. So we're here to talk about land and reparations in our relation and the relation of those. How can we question, expand, and reevaluate the notions that we typically attribute to um, reparations? Uh, I'll first, um, I'll, I'll let each of the speakers introduce themselves. Um, and with really no, well, I suppose I can introduce myself. I didn't do that at the beginning. Hi, I'm Jared. Uh, I'm the head of Pratt Futures. Um, Pratt Futures is a student-led um, lecture series at Pratt. We focus on bringing um, emerging designers, artists, thinkers, um, as well as those pushing the envelope and their respective um, their respective work areas and start to try and bring conversation and interdisciplinary conversation at most. Uh, we try and highlight um, plat platforms and people we think uh, deserve more light. And I mean, we do as the best we can. Um, with that, I want to hand it over to Robin. Uh, well, yeah, I'll just hand it over to Robin. Uh, after Robin, we'll go to Kofi and then Neff. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you for this invitation. And thank you for um, the very rich uh, programming that you are providing, pushing the envelope and exploring innovative thought and design. My name is Robin Rue Simmons. I am the executive director of First Repair, where we inform local reparations nationally. I am the most recent retired alderman of the Fifth Ward in Evanston, Illinois. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I have um, experience in residential development, affordable housing, and uh, residential construction. I am a native of the Fifth Ward, which is historically uh, segregated Black community in Evanston, which is a Chicago suburb, uh, predominantly white and affluent, the home of Northwestern University, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm also the visionary and leader of the nation's first reparations movement that was in Evanston, and now I really enjoy supporting other localities in thinking about how they may do what's appropriate for their city. Hello everyone, my name is Kofi Boone. I'm not on the screen right now because I'm on the road, unfortunately, but happy to be with you. Appreciate the invitation uh, to follow on the land acknowledgement. I'm coming from the land of the Saponi and the Shikori and the Eno and the Lumbee. Uh, so um, ask their permission to share these words with you from where I am in North Carolina, where I teach landscape architecture at NC State. I'm a Detroit native and I've spent most of my academic and professional career working with and for black communities around the country, but specifically work we've done in North Carolina. Uh, I tried to promote democratic design principles, working collaboratively with communities and not coming in imposing ideas. Uh, and I write, and I'm very thankful that people actually read what we write these days because there's one article uh, that was referenced in the introduction, Black Landscapes Matter, which I will talk about uh, a little bit later. But once again, thank you and look forward to the conversation. Blessings, everyone. Thank you again for this opportunity to be here. I also want to acknowledge um, that I'm here coming from the land of my foremothers and fathers, Ma'at Mountain on the island of Fogu in Cabo Verde on the western coast of the great continent of Africa. And 
My name is Asna Farka, um, aka Neff, and I am a revolutionary. I'm a spiritual warrior. I am really, you know, one of the main positions that brings me here today is the co-founder of Tehuti Ma'at, which is a revolutionary instrument that is working towards the unification and liberation of African people worldwide and the restoration and reclamation of Ma'at, which is divine balance, cosmic harmony, truth, justice, and reciprocity back to our planet. And I am really just glad to be here. And I just wanna acknowledge that I'm in great company and I'm looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you. Um, thank you all for introducing, I suppose, yourself. <laughs> and um, Robin, if you want to just take it away. Sure. Um, so I have 15 minutes, is it? Because I know how to talk in like two minutes and an hour. So I want to make sure I get it right. 15 um, minutes? 15 to 20 should be. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so as we all know, um, the history of Black America is... Um, founded in uh, tragedies, trauma, terror, uh, racism, and it is not historic. We uh, live in those conditions today. And um, although slavery has been outlawed, we are experiencing its vestiges. We are looking at um, contemporary forms of oppression that sustain our divide our disparate conditions in the black community, barriers to everything um, but poverty, it seems like. And in my elected role, I decided that I would use that office to the um, highest and best opportunity to serve black people. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in a historically black neighborhood. Early in my childhood education, I attended an all black neighborhood school, our schools um, were desegregated to the disadvantage of our black families, meaning that um, the community that I live in is the only community that does not enjoy a neighborhood school and we are bused outside to several different uh, schools in the community to um, satisfy our diversity. Our city Evanston is really um, celebrated for being diverse and inclusive and welcoming and our, dem our demographics say that. But in 2019, I grew very frustrated that it was only in a ceremony alone, that we could not, con con we could not continue to celebrate our diversity while we had a $46,000 household income divide between Black and White Evanston, over-policing, extreme over-policing, uh, academic um, divides and opportunity gaps and de deteriorating housing stock, environmental injustices in our neighborhood, and so on, lack of investment and intentional disinvestment, and that we had to do something radically different. And so what I did in 2019 was I really used all of the efforts of equity that we had implemented in the past that in fact have been award-winning in municipal professional organizations uh, but had not done nearly enough. And I introduced the idea of localizing reparations. So we all know that reparations has been a goal for Black people. We've been long suffering. This is not a contemporary matter. We have been actively involved in our liberation uh, for centuries. And in fact, there are over 250 um, documented cases of our attempt at uprising and we, we know about 40 acres and a mule and more contemporary uh, HR 40, which was introduced in 1989. And so that is to address uh, the slavery, its vestiges, uh, but it does not do enough to address what we can do in the here and now in our neighborhoods. And that is where local reparations came in. Excuse me, I have a little toddler here in a second, where local reparations came in. And so what I did was I simply looked at our history in Evanston. Uh, what were our anti-Black practices? And I was able to get those answers in great detail from D Dino Robinson and his partners at Shorefront Legacy Center. 
I hope that the website was shared. You can see the 77 page report that details the anti-Black policies in Evanston. Um, so we were able to get that account of our anti-Black practices and then look at how did that inform our current conditions today. Today, we're still racially segregated. We still lack investment in important community amenities um, and, and assets in our Black neighborhood. And how can we begin to address that? And so um, I took this to an Equity Empowerment Commission and then called to the community of stakeholders, Black people of Evanston, what do we see as a priority and how we feel repaired? What could be redressed for us? How can we be made whole or attempted to be made whole for the actions of the city of Evanston? And there were recommendations all across the board, some not in our purview, like Northwestern should give free tuition or we should have a school in the fifth ward and others that were in our purview. And many of the recommendations were around housing redlining, predatory lending practices, overassessed uh, Cook County property taxes, uh, deteriorating housing uh, stock, access to weatherizing our old drafty homes in Evanston, access to purchasing homes with down payment assistance and other forms of financial uh, resources so that we could even enter into home ownership. And we were able to take that information from the community, the black community, and come up with our first uh, priority and how we might begin to repair that specific harm. And so right now it's clear to know that, it's important to note that we're talking about a policy in Evanston uh, that was introduced in 1991, enforced in 1921 until fair housing was passed in 1968. And so from 1919 until 1969, we are acknowledging a era of harm to the black community as it relates to housing and building wealth through housing. Because this zoning ordinance and housing law restricted the black community to live in the western of the fifth ward, it's where I still live today, and later disinvested in that neighborhood. And so we began a path to redress um, that, that uh, wrong in the black community. I should go back and state that in 2019, when we passed this policy, um, we decided to use our recreational cannabis sales tax. So in the state of Illinois, uh, there was a legislation passed to legalize uh, recreational cannabis. Our city decided to um, embrace that new policy, embrace that new revenue stream, and tax it at 3% the max but we had not decided on what we would do with that tax. Generally, it would go into a uh, general fund to help do the business of municipal government, uh, but it was appropriate in our case, as we were looking to advance reparations, that we use that fund for reparations, and here's why. 71% of the marijuana arrests in our city were in the Black community, while we had declined to only 16% of the population, and all studies that I have found is that black and white uh, consumers of cannabis consume at the same rate. So we made that decision in November, November 25th to be exact of 2019, resolution 126R19, where we passed this legislation to begin the road to repair. And so this program will allow residents that uh, are awarded. This is gonna be black residents that either lived here between 19 and 69 or their direct descendants. So I qualify through uh, you know, a lineage of black residents and black family members that live here as a direct descendant of those that were directly harmed. Um, in fact, I have six generations of my family that are Evanstonians. And so, the benefit will go to those that are eligible and the eligibility or benefit is able to be used for uh, housing wealth or housing equity more specifically. And in that case, it is, uh, has a direct correlation to the harm in Evanston. It's very specific. There's been a lot of conversation nationally and, and locally and regionally about what we're doing in Evanston and how it's not um, going to address the racial gap and how it's not reparations. In fact, it is reparations because it is repairing a harm 
And it's not going to address the racial wealth gap because we're one municipality. So it's also important to note that while we do this work in Evanston, we also are very strong and vocal advocates of HR 40, a federal reparation legislation that has been pending and languishing in Congress since 1989. However, it has made an important step passing the judiciary this last April. Um, but what we will do is we will deliver these benefits this year, actually, the applications are open now until October 5th, and the benefits will go to purchase a home, uh, rehab a home that you have already, and with no restrictions, it could be deferred maintenance, it could be to add, you know, accessibility uh, features to your home so that you can age in place, it could simply be to pay down your mortgage so that you have access to more equity or have access to it in the future. Um, but either way, the benefit is used, it builds $25,000 of wealth. One thing that isn't really talked about much is the value add of a uh, resource guide to complement and add value to the $25,000 of home equity or housing benefits uh, where Black business businesses can support and participate. Um, so we have a, uh, a robust program. We have a lot of interest, a lot of demand. We are funding this work with our cannabis revenue, which is coming in incrementally. So that means we're rolling out the program incrementally. The first allocation will be 16 uh, recipients to receive 25,000. And this is with cannabis just becoming a, a new uh, industry in our city with only one dispensary. We have space for more dispensaries and those cannabis dispensaries are being awarded um, as we speak by the state of Illinois. So the good news is that we have begun the work. Um, the the uh, frustrating news is that there's certainly a lifetime of work ahead of me and those that will come after me because we are looking to address housing inequality, zoning laws that were rooted in anti-Blackness. It was rooted and written in an era of time where we were uh, less than a person. We were, we were insignificant. It was in a time of Jim Crowing and, um, and, and Black codes and other anti-Black practices that have harmed us and continue to harm us because they have not been repaired. Uh, equity work alone has not been enough to address the um, egregious acts and conditions in the Black community, and we must do radical policy work. We must be intentional and unapologetic about serving the Black community specifically in response to our specific harms. Um, another thing that I should mention is that we have a very diverse Black community, and so we are fortunate to enjoy um, Black folks from all over the diaspora and have been present in Evanston during this period of injury. So there is no, what I love about what we're doing here in Evanston, there's no need for discussion on where in the diaspora, if you had your um, ancestors were enslaved in America or in Haiti or in the Caribbean islands, um, together we are in this struggle together and we will fight for redress and receive redress in Evanston um, together as a body of black people. Um, the conversation on reparations is very, very complex. And the discussion is much different at a, at a federal level as it should be. The harm is much different. In Evanston, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have uh, the institution of slavery um, in our city. Uh, but we are taking our steps in Evanston based on our history, and the uh, program is being rolled out over time. It's a 10-year commitment initially. When I made the introduction in 2019, it always was with the hope that future councils and other institutional accomplices in town will continue this work beyond the initial 10-year uh, commitment, as it states in our legislation. This work really should continue in perpetuity for us to begin to um, work towards bridging that racial gap that is discussed um, all over the nation and different communities in various ways. Um, but right now we have a 10 year program that has inspired other cities to begin to think about um, what their history is and how they may redress that. 
Evanston um, can be considered a model, but it really should be considered more inspiration for cities to do their own work for the stakeholders, for the Black folks in those communities to come in and uh, give feedback on how they would like to see repair and not a, this is certainly not something that could be a cookie cutter approach, kind of one, one project fits all in reparations. That's absolutely not the case. Um, the history must be um, thorough and the remedy must be thoughtful. And there must be many partners like you all, like you know, young thought leaders, academics, other professionals that need to be a all hands on deck conversation for redress because there were many layers of institution, layers of government, um, various industries that played a role in our harm. And so it's important that we all come together and think about our repair. And that can be in all forms. In our city, we have an accessory dwelling uh, organization that is looking at how we can provide um, additional housing units for existing homeowners to add value and wealth to their properties, but also add a place of transition for young adults or seniors to age in place. And so they're looking at, we've worked together on how we can use accessory dwelling or coach houses um, and other forms of accessory dwellings to add benefit and value and wealth to um, historically black neighborhoods. And there are others that are helping us think about it. The banking institutions, I've been working with banks to think about how we might uh, reimagine our uh, mortgage products that are reparative in nature and how uh, regulatory bodies need to rethink uh, regulations and finance. And we need to continue looking at zoning because we have not uh, pulled out all of that baked in racism that remains there today, even after fair housing was passed. Um, so the work continues, but I have to say, I'm very proud of our city for taking this bold, unprecedented step to address reparations, do it in a tangible way. Um, there are still only two other cities that have even named um, a commitment, a financial commitment, that's Asheville and, um, and Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, but we have actually begun to fund ours. We have $10 million initially allocated and our funding is happening and we will um, deliver our first reparation benefits actually this November of this year. Um, so there's a lot of information on uh, the City of Evanston website. It has all the background. It has our meeting minutes. It has the case for reparations in Evanston, it's 77 pages. It has resources that I felt were very important to me as I began at being educated on reparations. It includes ta Coates' case for reparations. Later in my work, the 1619 project was released by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Um, the cost of segregation was done by the Metropolitan Planning Council. Um, of course, all the, the color of law um, that was written. So I've shared much of the resources that I use this education and pass along to my colleagues on the 80th City Council. Um, and we were educated together and there are many, more, many more resources um, that are out there, but the city of evanston.org backslash reparations has a list of those um, resources that we use as well as recordings of our town halls. Um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has been in attendance and supported our town halls. Um, and then if you have questions about local reparations, you can find more at uh, firstrepair.org and you can learn more about our goals for local reparations and stay in touch with us there. And I just wanna again, thank you. I imagine that we're gonna have some time for questions after this and I look forward to answering them. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that was beautiful. Uh, Kofi, are you uh, able or ready? I am here, I am here. Do you have a presentation? No, I thought I'd follow uh, Robin's lead and just talk. Beautiful, um, so, okay. So I'm happy to just continue that, continue that on. Okay, take your away. Uh, and that was an incredible presentation. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, again, my name is Kofi Boone. I teach landscape architecture at NC State University in North Carolina, which is where I'm calling from. Uh, I currently live in Chapel Hill, 
North Carolina, but I'm a native of Detroit, Michigan. And uh, for many years led a Ghana study abroad program, uh, spending a lot of time in West Africa. So I've had a chance to uh, examine a lot of these issues from different perspectives, but also from the academic wing. So I think we've heard an incredible presentation about the, in the political realm and the community realm. I'm gonna be looking at it from more of the academic and the research realm, but try and make some connections. And you know, the first one that I would make which is actually related to the first presentation is a comment that a good friend of mine and a colleague, Julian Edgemon at Tufts makes. We're co-writing some articles right now about the idea of the black commons, which I'll get to in a second. But Julian talks about becoming and belonging that we spend a lot of time on focusing on becoming. And in the case of a lot of people in the room, uh, the professional technical skill set to practice architecture or design as you will or from whatever background you're coming from, uh, but we don't spend as much time talking about belonging and how that's essential as well. You can't have one without the other. And it's time for us to focus on that and with regards to black communities. Uh, our, until recently and after incredible agitation, uh, absence from the canon of what we consider design, urban design, landscape architecture, urban planning, and the revelation that we've always been there. And so it's been an interesting time. And a lot of this conversation came out of uh, a call from a good friend of mine, also a hero, uh, Walter Hood uh, at Hood Design based in Oakland, California in 2017, uh, wanted to host a conference sort of uh, commemorating 25 years since uh, the Rodney King verdict uh, in 27, excuse me, in uh, 1997, which for a lot of us was our George Floyd moment in the sense of seeing injustice play out in close to real time and feeling like no consequences were being levied for uh, really the police brutality extended against uh, Mr. King who lived different from George Floyd, uh, rest in peace. But how far have we come in that 25 year period? And so he, he called a number of us to Berkeley where he teaches and uh, out of that came the article that some of you've read, Black Landscapes Matter, which starts to at that time take some of the core ideas that were associated with the Black Lives Matter movement, particularly a quote from Alicia Garza, uh, when asked what are the true goals of it, she said, you know, uh, to be seen, to live with dignity and to be connected and to start to use that as a lens to look back at uh, where we are as a community and our role historically and the evolution of what in my uh, profession we call landscape architecture, but you might call many different things. And really starting to see at that time, this incredible uh, black creative ethos as emerging. It seemed like every other discipline of design was booming, right? So from people who were into media arts and graphic design and music uh, and performance and every venue you saw young black people uh, really blossoming and thriving and having platforms except for the areas of architecture and landscape architecture and trying to figure out, you know, why is that the case and how can we reconnect ourselves uh, spiritually and culturally to our creative ethos. And so that led to a deeper dive of my own region, right? I'm not a native of North Carolina. So looking in my own backyard and seeing, you know, what, what the stories are. And, you know, really when I moved to the South, uh, you know, I had a lot of trepidation, a lot of attitudes about it, uh, a lot of information that was presented about it being a hostile, horrible white supremacist sort of uh, infused landscape of which a portion of that is true even till today but was excited to discover these incredible uh, contributions by black people and black communities in the face of incredible adversity. And you know, even on plantations, some of the worst and most traumatic experiences in human history, the, the African Holocaust that brought millions of our ancestors across the ocean uh, to work for generations uh, for no pay uh, for white people. And the idea that uh, even on plantations, people started to claim common areas, uh, yam grounds and yam fields and other places to uh, pass seeds, like people smuggled seeds in from West Africa to continue the tradition of the plants and nutrition and the connection to the earth that they brought with them. They traded songs and stories. They shared information, taught each other skills. So even in the midst of that incredible level of uh, oppression and, and, uh, and inhuman humanity, uh, they were able to sustain themselves culturally. Uh, 
during that time also importing skill sets that they learned from West Africa. And so as a outsider to the Southern experience and uh, brainwashed by a lot of the media portrayals of what enslaved Africans were about in the South, even I thought that, hey, some of these skill sets that were used on plantation grounds were taught to them uh, by their white masters, when in fact, in many cases, it was the opposite. And the case that we began with in the Carolinas was, you know, South Carolina and Charleston in particular was one of the original wealthy cities of the whole country, right? The, the, the region of the South was the wealthiest because of the exploitation, the, the, uh, the, the devastation of indigenous Americans removal from that land and then the importation of enslaved Africans to do that free labor. Uh, but uh, rice plantations in Charleston uh, were a direct descendant from practices that have existed for hundreds of years prior uh, in West Africa. The Volof people, Senegal, had created dike systems and gates and flooding and actually did a lot of the work that we would call landscape architecture. And because uh, many of our ancestors had the sickle cell trait, uh, meaning that they were malaria resistant, not um, immune, uh, and because the southeastern United States was high in terms of malaria, and a lot of white folks and white uh, uh, sort of colonizers uh, were succumbing to that disease for extended periods in plantations like Middleton Place and other places. Uh, there were Africans only there, essentially, even in incredible trauma, taking the knowledge and the skill sets that they brought with them from the other side and applying them to the United States to build that original wealth and how they're not recognized or credited in any way. Uh, they're relegated as uh, labor, uh, but they were essential to the economic and political machine that eventually uh, became the largest uh, in the world. Uh, moving forward after the end of slavery, uh, formal slavery, uh, the first impetus of African people, people of African descent was to seek out their loved ones that had been sold or, or had been traded to other parts of our country, uh, but then to claim land. And so uh, between the Freedmen's Bureau and the bank and a number of other issues, uh, people really wanted to root in place and take, take advantage of some of those, those opportunities that were afforded to them. You heard reference to 40 Acres and the Mule in the previous presentation. That's something that did not come to pass, as you all well know, uh, that uh, for political reasons, actually for re-election and for bringing Southern states in line to elect uh, uh, an American president, two things were really critical uh, that took that away. Initially, uh, 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 land was being taken by the War Department of the United States away from Confederate people to give to Black people. Uh, that was something that was the initial intent of that land redistribution program. Uh, that did not, that got canceled out by the then sitting president, overrode the Congress who had approved that uh, so that he could keep uh, white voters in the South uh, supporting his candidacy. And of course, uh, no uh, uh, penalty uh, for Confederates reentering the Union. So people were pardoned and allowed to come back in, which planted the seeds for after uh, uh, Reconstruction era, 1855 to 1877, uh, the era of uh, here, uh, what they call restoration in the South, which is the removal of Union armies to reinforce those Confederate, those, excuse me, those Reconstruction laws. Uh, and really with that and Plessy versus Ferguson, the birth of Jim Crow. And so those two uh, moments where Black people were pawns in the larger political game removed of land uh, removed a penalty from people who brought them harm for centuries uh, that persisted. But even in the midst of that trauma, you find people uh, building black towns, building black institutions, universities, forming cooperatives. Uh, W.B. Du Bois and some of his groundbreaking research stemming from the Philadelphia Negro moving forward wrote extensively about black cooperatives as a way to take the shared resources of African-Americans across the country and pooling them together to feed businesses, to feed the building of institutions. Where I'm in North Carolina, NC Mutual Life Insurance Company and Mechanics and Farmers Bank were two components uh, that produced a Black Wall Street in Durham, North Carolina, connected to the Haytide District here. Uh, until the 1960s, Mechanics and Farmers Bank, NC Mutual Life were the largest employers of African-Americans in the country. And this is in the midst of the Jim Crow South. This is a midst of, of incredible segregation. Historically black colleges and universities, uh, of course, the great work of Booker T. Washington, who hired the first professionally uh, trained graduate uh, in architecture, uh, Robert Taylor from MIT to come and help him build 
what is now known as Tuskegee Campus, what was then known as Tuskegee Institute. It's important to know that students went to classes three days a week, but they worked three days a week uh, to build the actual campus, making the bricks, making the glass, uh, building the foundations and the structures of buildings, literally raising the grounds out of Alabama red clay. And people who graduated from that institution went on to sort of spread that imperative wherever they went, uh, the towns in Oklahoma and in Texas, or where we are in North Carolina, the Palmer Institute, where my students are working right now, you know, the first private black college preparatory schools in the nation founded by Dr. Uh, Dr. Brown, Charlotte Hawkins Brown in Sedalia, North Carolina, who in turn did the same thing, right? Raised a campus out of the ground in the midst of the Jim Crow South. And so a lot of that article is about reclaiming that legacy and saying, yes, there's been trauma. Yes, there's been disruption, serial disruption as talked about by Mindy Fulalo, uh, who wrote the incredible book, Root Shot, which talks about uh, serial displacement of black communities dating to first contact uh, with Europeans and colonizers, definitely through slavery, but including uh, the era that we just heard about in the previous presentation, the impacts of redlining, urban renewal, freeway construction, devastating generational impacts on black communities, intentional. Uh, so uh, the idea that in the face of all that trauma, people still rose, they still organized, they still worked. So continuing on from that legacy, uh, we've tried to do a couple of different things. One is have that impact how we prepare the next generation of, of ourselves, right? How we reproduce as design professionals. And so that's mean, been critically thinking about how we teach it, how we prepare students to engage, particularly black communities, how we uh, treat them with dignity and respect, uh, how we acknowledge uh, the, the, the incredible contributions that people made, the assets, and not just the liabilities and the traumas and how we can work collaboratively to a shared future. And just two short stories about that particular kind of work. One is Princeville, North Carolina, which was the first charter town founded by free blacks in the United States, 1865, founded as Freedom Hill, uh, later uh, 1887 as uh, Princeville, a small town in uh, Edgecombe County on the Tar River because of its location in the floodplain. Uh, at consistent risk of flooding with events. And so with climate change and increased hurricane damage uh, everywhere in the world, uh, they are always at risk. And so they were devastated by Hurricane Matthew several years ago. Uh, we organized a week long workshop to help people think about positive futures and persuaded the state of North Carolina to annex 53 acres of land on high ground rather than to close the town, shrink it, uh, help it build incrementally in resilient fashion, working collaboratively with local people. It started with getting to know their heritage and elevating that story. Uh, it moved on to uh, an interesting sidebar of a mobile museum, which I can talk about in question and answer if people are interested in that. But more uh, uh, concretely, uh, investments, resilient investments in their school, which allows their elementary school to reopen, which then attracts families and attracts people back to the town to build some stability. And most recently, a BRIC uh, $10 million grant from the federal government to finalize the annexation of 53 new acres, which actually makes the town the biggest it's ever been. So it went from shrinking, smaller, uh, other uh, uh, components when we arrived. Now it's annexing, growing, and we're expecting uh, that to continue. Uh, and another example, which was shared uh, online and social media, is our work in South Park, East Raleigh. Uh, one of the first African-American communities in Raleigh, built around Shaw University, Shaw uh, Historically Black College, among other things, the institution that founded the organization called St Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, by North Carolina native Ella Baker. Uh, the park next to it, John Chavis Memorial Park, named after the first black educator in the state of North Carolina that could teach both white and black students. Uh, and uh, uh, the peril that that park was in, in terms of its erasure, like the loss of key elements that were important to communicating the community's culture and reproduce it, pass it on to the next generation. So uh, what we found was that in traditional documentation, we weren't able to find the evidence that supported these communities' views, like why they thought this place was so important. So in that uh, moment, uh, we examined how to use mobile devices and smartphones uh, as a way to empower local people to tell their own stories and share them. 
and I know many of you do that anyway as just a, a part of routine, but I would say 10 or 15 years ago, particularly if you consider uh, senior black women, women that were pretty much your grandmother's age, who many in cases didn't have a smartphone, this was an important thing. So we got free phones, free service from AT&T, uh, as long as people participated in a training session, they were able to take those phones and record as much as they wanted. And because it was geo-referenced, we were able to map where these stories were being told. Uh, we were able to work with an historic uh, uh, preservation specialist to do the proper archival research to verify a lot of those stories. And that led to the park's designation on the National Register of Historic Places. It was used as evidence for a bond issue for $17.5 million first phase reinvestment, the first investment in this park in over 50 years, uh, of which the ribbon cutting of that first phase happened this summer. So in both of those stories, you can see it took a long period of time. It took deep engagement, it took trust building, it took a bit of innovation, but all in the interest of centering it around the stories and the interests and the values of those local communities and providing benefits along the way. So as you move towards uh, more of the concrete things that we're more trained to do as professional designers, there are things along the way that still have utility function and purpose uh, for that local community. Uh, I'll close out my remarks with just current work. Uh, I sit on the board, uh, the Black, uh, land loss prevention project organization led by the incredible Savvy Horn that really helps uh, black farmers retain their land, uh, uh, which is at risk uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, if you added up all the land that was lost in the 20th century alone, starting at 1920 by black people in the American South, the current value of that total land would be $1 trillion. And when you think about the idea of commoning and the idea of sharing uh, an idea of building wealth, that's a trillion dollars that we don't have as a community that we could have used uh, for generational uh, change. So the organization really focuses on that. And what we try to provide is technical support and assistance, mapping, finding ways to engage communities more creatively, strategic thinking to help that organization move forward. And also with Black Bank USA and the Cowery Initiative under the leadership of Stefan Coward uh, has been, we've been working with them to describe a totally different ecosystem uh, that most people don't pay attention to. So they started with documenting black banks. And if you go to their website, they have an online map showing black and black serving banks in the United States. Uh, with students, we're able to start to talk about this component of a black commons, a common shared set of resources that are uh, components of, of cooperatives, black and black serving cooperatives, black and black serving community land trust together. We're able to document around 50 of these and add those two layers to the map. So our goal is to continue to produce this information for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, education, uh, particularly with black communities who are looking for resources where they can build into an ecosystem that's really focused on building and long-term growth. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll stop, I'll say thanks, and I'm excited to get into the conversation to go. Thank, I, again, thank you for an amazing um, presentation, is that, or just speaking, honestly. Um, and Neff, I suppose we'll go over to you, and then I want to make a quick comment that afterwards we will have a question session, so, um, or Q&A session, so um, uh, we encourage everyone to ask any questions they have. Um, yeah, Neff. Thanks. I am just, you know, just deeply confirmed in just the connected spirit and appreciating the work of both of you. And really, I, I'm going to have to use my presentation. I'm actually literally going to set a timer. <laughs> I don't use a presentation. <laughs> um, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, um, yes. Oh, I just um, want to make sure you can share. Um, it looks like I can. All right. Beautiful. All right. Okay, great. So, all right. Can you see everything fine? I didn't mention that I'm a a healing artist, a multidiscipline, multidimensional healing artist. I was thinking about like, maybe let me just follow suit, but I want to show my art <laughs> um, just in terms of this presentation and crafting 
a way to visually stimulate and show these ideas. Um, I wanna first start off by actually asking um, my fellow panelists who are my elders for permission to speak. If you may please give me permission to speak. Permission granted. Good, thanks. And I'm assuming that Kofi is giving me permission as well. Silence is acquiescence. <laughs> per permission granted. Good, thanks. All right, so as I said, I am the co-founder. I'm also the Nesubiti, the uh, operational director of Tehuti Ma'at. Um, and really everything that we do is focused on land and reparations. And I just wanna begin first with just allowing us to really just take a breath and really come into everything that's already been said. because it's so much, you know, to just really be present with, with all of the work that has already been done. <sighs> to begin within the beginning, through our breath, we honor the divinity that we are, as we are, all connected. To take a conscious breath before we begin. We began our journey into eternity to liberate our African mind, the cosmic mind, the divine mind, to find the answers to how, to find the way to liberate our African body and spirit. We are free in soul and connected to all those who have led the way, Ashe. So I'm just gonna flow through um, sharing. First, just gonna orient us ancestrally, right? Into our cosmic eternal perspective and then go into you know, our story, how we got here because we are in the continuum and I give thanks for um, both Robin and Kofi laying the foundation that they did. Um, and because I am going to be speaking a bit about the work of my elders that, um, you know, whose shoulders I stand on. And I always acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders of giants from the elders who are living legends, but the ancestors who came before us who have done tremendous work to get us here. Um, and then we're going to go into the Tehuti Ma'at ideology and the 11 pillar platform and Tehuti Ma'at as a revolutionary instrument. And first, I just wanna begin cosmically by acknowledging and raising that Tehuti Ma'at is, it's a, it's a force, they are forces of nature, complementary forces of nature. So this is beyond, beyond tangibility although Tehuti Ma'at also functions as a revolutionary instrument, which I'll talk about later, Tehuti Ma'at are complementary cosmic principles. So the principle of Tehuti being the divine masculine in this, um, in this complementary relationship and Ma'at being the divine feminine expression within this cosmic relationship. And what both of these energies represent are really symmetrical to one another. Most of this comes from our ancient Kemetic or what some people would say ancient Egyptian, but this is really from the ancient Africans of the Hapi Valley, known today as the Nile Valley, where modern day Sudan, Ganda, the um, Great Lakes region, the, um, and modern day Egypt as well. But just to give context of the totality and the origin as the Nile flows from the south, to the north. And Tehuti and Ma'at are these cosmic energies that really are ever present and eternal. Tehuti is the energy of wisdom and knowledge, as well as communication and expression. And it's what you see on the screen here with this Ibis bird, which is how our ancestors depicted it as a nature-based tradition and deeply artistically inclined 
and mathematically inclined um, tradition, this um, symbol may have been because this ibis bird, when you see it on the beach or over by the riverbank, when it's eating, it looks like it's signing a signature, it's writing. So Tehuti was seen as the scribe. And Ma'at being the symbol that is in front of it on this artifact that we're looking at um, is depicted as a woman with a feather, ostrich feather on her crown. And the ostrich feather representing the feather of truth. This comes from the first depictions of the scales of justice because Ma'at is truth and justice. Ma'at is symmetry, it's totality, it's whole, it's, whole, it's um, reciprocity, it's balance, it's the equilibrium. And um, this was depicted with the scales of Ma'at where the heart is weighed against the feather of truth, which is this ostrich feather. And that's just to keep it light. So the holistic symmetry is really the foundation of our cosmic mind and our um, human legacy. So these symbols that are on the screen are really just to orient us back into that divine symmetry as we're experiencing incredible imbalance on this planet um, currently, inner turmoil, um, all kinds of expressions of this. But really, we can always return to the cosmic truth of holistic symmetry, right? And complementary energies that are in constant communication in the cosmos. And the symbol that's in the center is the Sankofa symbol of the, it's an Adinkra symbol from the Akan people in West Africa. And this symbol is said to be, said to represent, go back and fetch it, right? It is going back into the future. This symbol right here, really epitomizes the wholeness of an African worldview, an African-centered um, perspective, because there is no dichotomy, which is very common in the Eurocentric um, worldview that we've been indoctrinated into, and that the systems that are, you know, all all the systems that are pretty much dominating the planet right now are operating within this dichotomized view of past, present, future and dividing things. And as I said, Ma'at is that symmetry, right? So as we're expressing through Tehuti that symmetry, we turn to the Sankofa as a living legacy of African tradition that is still active and very present to show us that what was in the past also creates what's in the future for us to go back and reclaim what is of value and bring that forward into our future. And I wanna use this quote by Baba John Hendrick Clark, slavery in the measurement of time, because we are the oldest people functioning on this earth, we were functioning 4 million years ago. When we look at the societies we have produced 500 years out of that time is one half of the wink of an eye. And really our story begins here. I just wanna break the shackles. Our story begins in the, ancient, in the ancient lands of our ancestors, right? Where we birthed civilization. And really the root of that is agriculture, which is very, very important because when we look at, when we go to all the museums that are accredited and valued, it's because these artifacts and the archeology, span the, the, the artistry and the grandeur of our ancient Nile Valley, Happy Valley, comedic ancestors. So I really want to raise that because without this transition from being hunter and gatherers to be able to actually stay in one place, cultivate the land, create surplus and be still and observe nature and create the various sciences, mathematics, architecture, astrology, astronomy, we wouldn't have all of the systems that we have now built on that foundation now. And I'm not gonna speak much about imperialism, but it is important for us to know, because this is why we're having this conversation when we're dealing with reparations, it's in the context of the African engineers, farmers, um, healers, and people who were kidnapped and, and, and stolen from their land and taken and um, you know forced to have power over them in terms of this dynamic that's then created with the invasion of imperialism, which we have to start with the Arab slave trade. Um, and then also the more notable, the European um, transatlantic um, trafficking of enslaved Africans 
and colonialism, the occupation, these so-called settler colonies that are created, right? And as African people colonized in, on Turtle Island, <laughs> we have to acknowledge the legacy and its continuum and how it's all connected because it's not that these people were just taken and brought over to this land to work. What happened to those who stayed behind? We had the devastation of colonialism. So this division of perspective and identity is really one that has been conjured in order to keep us divided, in order to maintain the status quo that has been created, which is the rampant um, exploitation and extraction of resources from Africa, from the people of our labor across the board. So from there, we also have to look at the liberation struggles that have taken place every step of the way. There was not one moment where people were not fighting back. There was not one moment where the spirit of resistance and freedom did not rise in the people. So even if it was one person, I think there's a lot of narratives that have to be dispelled around that. But in the context of independence, the independence movements that were happening on the continent, the abolition, the civil rights movement, the black power movement. And I'm actually not going to include the movement that's taking place now because really what my intention here is to reclaim and return us to where we left off in the continuum, not the orchestrated narrative that has been presented, which has replaced the black liberation movement with the Black Lives Matter movement. So. I'm gonna use the words of Mama Asada, of course, here. Um, people are really beginning to see the mechanisms of imperialism. When colonialism existed, people could see colonialism. When racial segregation existed in its apartheid form, people could see the whites only signs. But it's too, it's much more difficult to see the structures of neo-colonialism, neo-imperialism, and neo-slavery. So I'm just gonna take a moment to Take a breath. I'm actually just gonna allow us to stay here with Mama Asada, wherever she is. So I wanna begin with my work in reparations and the context in which I came into um, this notion, this idea was really through on the ground work. And this is when, you know, bef right before the cry of like Black Lives Matter became the, the, you know, commercialized and, and brought forward, just really being on the ground in New York City, protest, protesting. And thankfully, my ancestors and my spirit aligned me to elders who have been doing this work consistently from a radical revolutionary context. context. So I first want to mention, obviously, I, I wasn't alive. I don't think that's obvious. I wasn't alive in 1982 when the International Tribunal on Reparations for Black People in the United States was um, in order when it took place. But I think this is a very important point of reference. Um, I learned about this from the Yoruba movement. There's actually a book titled Reparations Now, which is an abbreviated report of the Tri International Tribunal on Reparations for Black People in the United States. Very important because in a whole systems context, when we're dealing with um, the need for justice collectively, um, we, do, we do have to have some degree of seriousness around that. And we have a lot of elders who have been very, very serious about that work. And this tribunal is a representation of that because it was a people's tribunal, which really steps us out of the context of their narrative and their system, which is very, very important. Because when we have a lot of these discussions, it's like you're going to the, you know, you're going to the, the, the beneficiary of your enslavement and asking to be free or demand or even demanding freedom in that case. It's like, well, what, you know, what do you expect there? Um, I think Lauren Hill said it best. Do we expect a system made for the elect to possibly judge correct, properly serve and protect, materially corrupt, spiritually amok, oblivious to the cause, prosperously bankrupt? Blind leading the blind, guilty never defined, filthy as swine, a generation pure in its own mind, legal extortion, blown out of proportion, in vain deceit, the truth is obsolete. Only two positions, victimizer or victim. I'm gonna have to stop because it's a lot, but that's the reality of the situation. So I think that having an international tribunal where you're gathering 
people of African ascent from all over the diaspora from on the continent and having this, um, this gathering and this trial is very, very significant for us. And I think is very notable. It's the first time that the quant they were quantifying the amount of value owed to African people in labor alone, which was 4.1 trillion, which is a gross understatement. And obviously just, you know, in inflation, there's a lot of other things to be taken into consideration, but it's a starting, it was a starting point. And um, we also, the, the Reparations Now movement is very strong. There's a lot of different organizations that have been a part of that movement. But for me, it was the December 12th movement, right? I have some others on here, but the December 12th movement, which is the International Secretariat, um, is really, it's a human rights organization based in, the, based in um, Brooklyn, New York City. And the elders there are coming from a legal standpoint, they are attorneys, and very serious, but really operating on the grassroots. So because, you know, that's how, that's how I came into this work. So the choice campaign, which is the plebiscite campaign, you know, different takes on it, was a very significant piece that was introduced by the December 12th movement that had never crossed my mind before, which was to uh, the call for a referendum and for us to actually question who we want to be governed by and to have, and to even for the idea to come forward that we don't have to be governed by this entity and be pleading with this entity. So a plebiscite is an international rec internationally recognized means to allow a people to decide by ballot how and by whom they should be governed. Black people have a right to self-determination and I believe that is the only way. And revolution is based on land as brother Malcolm said, Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. And I'm only saying that to say everything is interconnected, holistic symmetry. We're not talking about reparations without talking about land. So I want, I have this video here. Hope you can hear. 400 people to Durban, South Africa, to have the UN declare the transatlantic slave trade and slavery is a crime against humanity and reparations are due to the descendants of the victims of that crime. This work group came out of the Durban Declaration and it's very important that people understand that. Our organizations, Raise and Dentro, is the freedom and liberation of black people here in the United States. The descendants of Africans enslaved here in what is now called the USA. I'm confident that you, the working group charged with looking at if the U.S. is responding to the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, are well informed. Therefore, I won't try your patience with the bloody, barbaric nature of my ancestors' enslavement here in the United States. However, I and we must seek some understanding of who the working group of people of African descent is and decipher the relationship to the history alluded to above. And I raise that in the context that our participation through the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights, the Human Rights Council, we organized the first meeting of the Special Rapporteur on Racism in 1994. We did the one with the second Special Rapporteur on Racism in 2009. We met with the this working group a year ago yesterday at our place in, in Brooklyn. And I raise all that to say that through all the visits that, that have occurred, the question becomes, what is this working group going to do? Because the issue has got to be, what does it mean in terms of the context of Durban, and in terms of the demand for reparations? Historically, from petitioning the League of Nations to William Patterson, we charge genocide at the United Nations. The West has and still resists paying compensation, paying reparations for the crimes they have committed. Our demand of this working group is that to simply catalog what's been cataloged over the last 20 years is insufficient. That our demand that this working group's recommendation has got to be that the United States fulfill its responsibility to pay for the crimes it's committed and continues to commit against people of African descent and that anything short of that will be a failure of what Durban represents and what the mandate of this working group is. Thank you. Free all political prisoners. Yeah. Free all political prisoners. Yeah. In mass incarceration. Yeah. Reparations.
Reparations. All right, so I believe I made this video in 2016 or 2015 um, when the UN Working Group on People of African Descent was in the was in the was in New York City, and I think this is very important because one, I want to raise that the United Nations did declare up until 2024 that it is the decade of people of African descent layered on top of all these other decades of different things, um, <laughs> which says a lot. But I also just wanna say, I'm not co-signing and expecting anything from the United Nations. I think it's very important for us to know that the United Nations is the establishment. It is an unelected body and a representation of Euro European imperialism. So we're also not gonna get anywhere from, with that. However, that doesn't mean we don't move forward in that lane. And in the context of holistic symmetry, it's very important for us to address this issue from all angles. Every single African person colonized anywhere on the planet in any of the occupied territories has a role to play. And part of the division has been people thinking that there's one solution or the solution that they're doing is the only solution, but we really have to be able to link arms and acknowledge that we're all interwoven and that every aspect is significant and important. So I also put on here, free all political prisoners and mass incarceration. This is about liberation holistically. And it's not about addressing one problem and it's really about reestablishing or re-establishing, right? Which is just honoring that solar principle when I say Ra, um, because we're on a solar powered planet and we are solar powered people. And it's very important for us to step into that power and into that narrative when it comes to liberating our ideas around even return, even revolving the situation, right? Because we revolve around the sun. I want to I want to make that clear. That's very important for us. That's one of the most significant natural models that we have to look at in the context of revolution. That sorry, I didn't realize the video was going to start again. So Dr. Barbara Sizemore says here, now, what do other groups do? They run together. And the first stage of that inclusion model is called separatism. And they come together because they have a common culture that saves them from obstacles. We need to think about being separate, right? Which goes back to that idea of um, just the idea that we're talking about of the plebiscite and um, the referendum and really coming to terms with even what Robin said earlier about um, you know, desegregation really having a negative impact in so many different dimensions. And part of our approach in terms of our ideology and in terms of even looking at this situation of land and reparations is this analysis right here. So looking at a whole system solutions to synthesize information and coming from an African centered perspective. So we're going to be looking at the cultural, economic, and political angles. And for Tehuti Ma'at, our organizational model and our institutional model in terms of developing institutions is in the areas of healing, creativity, and education. And we feel they correspond as such, right? And the reason why that's really important is because power is the ability to define phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner. And when Huey P. Newton said that, I really think that the significance of that statement, power is the ability to define phenomenon. We have to take the power of definition. We have to define for ourselves what we mean by reparations, define for ourselves what we mean by liberation, define for ourselves what we mean by revolution. And in the context of land, we're going to use this pyramid analysis, which is by Dr. Leonard Jeffries, right? So we're looking at these three spectrums, right? the cultural being the cosmology, right? Looking at our values and, you know, coming from that indigenous cosmic nature-based perspective, we really have to reclaim and return to that from a soul level, um, from a spiritually liberated level um, and really reclaim and repair our culture. Um, so that, that um, cultural renaissance, so to say. And, you know, our ma'afa, um, which is a Swahili word for disaster, which Mama Marimba Ani speaks of our, um, the African Holocaust in those terms as the Ma'afa. 
Um, it has really, that's one of the key things that it did was really sever our, it really just removed us from our cultural traditions, which was very strategic and intentional. Um, from an ecological standpoint, thinking about the production, right? We're thinking about what is economics, defining that for ourselves, as Huey said, right? Because if we're looking at it in terms of the imperialist, um, and the, 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 the European world order, we would be thinking about banks and debit cards and financing, but really what we need to be thinking about are our needs and what economics actually is, which is energy, water, food, clothing, shelter, security, protection. And in the context of sociology um, and the actual administration of the ecology, the economics, how are these things going to be organized, right? This is really the context of nation building. And it's a responsibility that I feel that we have not wanted to take up. <laughs> and we've had so many ancestors before us who have already laid the way. And it's like people running in circles, really not wanting to pick up the ball, but it's time, right? It's gotta be managed. You want freedom, how are you gonna manage it? So that's how I think about reparations. Um, yes, Is it, oh, I, gotta I, I, I wanted to allow you to show a bit of, um, a bit of work and a bit of examples okay. of what you do, but, um, yeah, I want to leave time for questions. Okay. Thank you. So we have an 11 pillar platform, which you can get familiar with on our website, tehutima.org. This is actually our ideology. And the way that it comes into form and into being beyond the reparations work that I expressed is really we created the institution of Tehuti Ma'at. And Tehuti Ma'at all started with the Sankofa pre-colonial African history or African story media workshop um, based off of my co-founder and I's backgrounds. He's a photographer. Um, I'm a marketing specialist and we're coming into all this knowledge and this information and we want to transmute it in the most strategic way possible, which is to the future, the children. So we began teaching the story, but also teaching them how to control their, create their own narrative and tell, retell these stories for themselves using digital media, using art um, in the garden, all kinds of different, um, you know, curriculums and expressions of this Sankofa work. We've also, directly from the activism around economics and reparations, came the Organic Food for the People initiative. As I was the co-director of the Harriet Tubman Fannie Lou Hamer Women's Collective, one of the initiatives as we were engaging Black women in bed which is a historically, um, historically Black um, community in, or I should say neighborhood, in New York, in Brooklyn, uh, we were engaging them on Black economic empowerment and really talking about the ways that we could actually, you know, take control of our food, clothing, shelter, and security. And obviously food was the most obvious one for us. And thus the Organic Food for the People um, initiative was conceptualized. And we acquired our first piece of land, which was really a rehabilitation project, um, restoring a dilapidated lot garden in in Weeksville, which is one of the first sovereign black communities in the um, divided states. And the work around organic food for the people is really to have this network of black urban growers, to have this um, educational platform where we have a series of different workshops that are called raw workshops. We teach things from the basics of growing food to health and nutrition and chemical warfare and all the different you know, realms and dimensions of um, food work. And that work has expanded and it just naturally revolved into many different, um, many different spaces, working with a lot of different um, community groups, working with um, emotionally challenged children, elderly um, people in, in elderly homes, working with um, different organizations. We started doing our healing circles and really gathering people in the context of healing because this is what the land was speaking to us. So Weeksville um, is also in the Lenape territory and all of the other ancient ones who have walked that land, we acknowledge um, that that land has a very powerful and pronounced spirit. And that's where Tehutima Garden is. And it serves as a model for the Organic Food for the People initiative 
so that anyone who wants to create a, um, a urban farm can follow that model and be able to do something similar. But I love what Robin said about nothing being really cut cookie cutter and really being able to use things as inspiration. But we also do have some organizational models that are present. And the cooperative has a lot of other institutions. And um, speaking of land, the Rooted Enterprise, which is the agricultural cooperative that I've co-founded here, um, is a significant contribution to the um, Te Huti Ma'at galaxy, because now we're working towards creating models for agricultural cooperatives that we're hoping to do internationally. And that work is very significant in terms of land work because it's very much about restorative agriculture and really reclaiming the narrative around um, climate change and not seeing that as a negative thing and really allowing nature to go through its process and its purging and be able to step in and acknowledge and respect that happening without taking on um, these external narratives and these Eurocentric perspectives on what is happening with our ecosystem and how we can support our ecosystem in revolving itself and healing itself. And I'll leave it at that. As I said, you can get more information on tehudima.org. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, author of you, for very enlightening and informative uh, presentations. I want to just uh, begin, begin by reminding everyone you can uh, drop any questions you have into the chat, and we will um, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, but until we get some, I'll start with some um, questions that came from before. Um, should um, should communities should communities be self sufficient, and is there a any institutional role in this? How can we strive for self-sufficient communities and push for reparations? What does this look like? I'll jump in there. Um, absolutely, we should be. And I think, you know, we just heard about self-determination um, and independence. And in thinking about this work, it's really intimate, it's specific to the community and that community's condition and that community's um, history in terms of crafting uh, reparations. But in terms of self-sufficiency or self-determination, um, I really want us to begin talking more about solidarity economics and how do we keep the dollar in our community longer than six hours um, as a black community is what we're seeing now and model more like our Asian allies that keep their dollars circulating, um, you know, 30 days within their community. But it all stems to the issue of our disinvestment. If we don't have the infrastructure, the, the, the retail and service infrastructure within our communities to, um, to, to provide services, goods and services to one another, it's difficult. So it still, for me, directs back to uh, redress and investment back into the community so that we do have access to um, practice solidarity economics and other forms of um, uh, the other practices that were mentioned in the presentation just before me that were so so brilliant community gardens and um, other types of um, bartering and sharing economies and so on. Um, I would love to hear more conversation about that as it relates to the reparations conversation, because the compensation can come, but if we aren't intentional about our solidarity and self-determination, then we won't really maximize that compensation from reparations. Um, thank you all for the presentations. It's I, I feel so privileged to have um, witnessed this. Um, I think one common thing that I uh, noticed in all, all of the work and starting with, of course, Robin's presentation was uh, this, this tangible sort of aspect of how do we, how does reparations really work? And it's so interesting that she came up with the, uh, the, that the idea was actually housing, 
and uh, repairing weathered homes or how do we uh, add financial benefits to homes? And in similar to in Kofi's work, that it, it was the idea of becoming and belonging and what's more important than that, but, but housing and the house that you actually live in or how we actually inhabit the land in Neff's presentation that it's where you live it's, uh, and that's how you inhabit it. So uh, what I kind of really wanted to ask uh, or sort of insight discussion with, with the three of you, anyone who feels comfortable jump in here, that how, uh, because most of us joining in are uh, designers, hopefully future design professionals, uh, when it comes to housing or when it comes to things like the commons, how do we as architects or young professionals stepping in um, really bring in these learnings that you all have so wonderfully illustrated here? I'll jump in again. I'm sorry, I'm not shy. <laughs> but I would say that um, thinking about uh, um, intergenerational uh, housing opportunities is a important way to um, sustain communities and build wealth and stability in families. And so my own lived experience having um, lived in many homes within my community because of various insecurities like housing and the stability of housing really strengthens families and therefore strengthens um, neighborhoods. Um, and then in addition to um, efficient efficiencies and how efficiencies aren't, a, aren't only great for our environment, which we need, need to learn more about how that um, benefits our overall wellness, but it's also cost savings in um, managing uh, utility costs and overall, um, overall wellness, financial wellness for families. And so I don't know if that answers your question at all, but those are some thoughts that I have. Thank you. I just wanted to go ahead and add in there as well. Um, I think that taking a more um, creative and whole, holistic approach to design is really important. I think that not only like the ecological impact, I think a lot of the conversation right now is around sustainability, which I think is kind of a flawed um, perspective because I think we really have to restore um, and heal certain systems before we can sustain them. Otherwise we'll be sustaining problematic things. So I think in terms of how do we think about designing for the future, even in terms of, um, you know, like how do we create a composting toilet situation that is modernized? How do we design spaces in a way that, um, you know, maybe they're more circular and less linear um, that, um, bring healing and just inspire um, a more liberated feeling when you walk into a space. I've seen a lot of like dome structures or just finding ways to um, creatively tap into, you know, your, your creative spark and source to find how those solutions come from within you because really it, it really is within and I believe strongly that each person has an important contribution but I think it has to really come from that deep work inside. And I think Robin said thoughtful remedy. The remedy must be thoughtful. So I think it's just really going inside and really thinking thoroughly and in community, you know, really being in community and really thinking about a lot of these places that um, people are buying cities and towns that need to be um, designed in a way that isn't going to you know, create the same pattern we've been in. Yeah, I would build from uh, the two sisters were saying, uh, it's just three things is that I know, and it's hard to hear someone who's in architecture, but architecture is a part, but not the whole solution to affordable housing and affordable housing is a component of affordable living. And people who don't have a lot of wealth in this cultural context are often overburdened in many areas, not just housing. And so uh, in, in this context, uh, it's also important to know that if you're building affordable housing, that it per square foot is not that much cheaper than profit for profit housing. So if you are interested in pursuing affordable housing, it's important to think about it as a regional issue. It's important to think about housing as a component of living and all the components of living that could be uh, made 
more in line with the level of access to wealth of the people that you're serving and really the critical role of policy. I think that coming out of design school, we're often trained to think that we can solve everything with a beautiful drawing, a great model and, and, and construction documents and you can't. By the time you get to that point, a lot of decisions have already been made and it's important to advocate for people to be at the table when decisions are being made um, that will deal with resources. One advantage of the idea of the commons, one component of it is the community land trust. And it's important to talk about its history. Uh, it was encoded in 1967 uh, through what became the Schumacher Center, but it was an extension of the modern civil rights movement in the sense that with pressure on political change, economic change, uh, there was another step, which is like, well, we gotta deal with land. And the radical notion of the land trust is it removes land uh, from the real estate speculative market. So it's not a wealth building strategy, but it is a way to say that, you know, land that's held in trust by communities is made permanently affordable by removing land value from all the equations. So whatever you put on it, whatever you do on it belongs to you, the benefits go to the collective, but in perpetuity, that land is removed from that speculative market. And when you start to discover how real estate and a lot of some of the not arbitrary, but really strategic uses of real estate are used uh, to exclude people from housing, to exclude people from opportunity, you realize that by rethinking this notion of property ownership, rethinking this notion of what should we really hold in common? And if affordable living is your value, why do we have to uh, limit that to whatever we can afford in terms of real estate and land. And the community land trust model attempts to redress that in a lot of ways. So I think that as architects, it means reaching beyond the boundaries of, of uh, your, your central skill set, which is uh, making great structures in great places. It's reaching out in a more expansive way. Um, thank you all. Uh, Harriet, I saw you had a question. Do you want to ask him? Oh, gosh, thank you. That's very kind. Um, hello, everybody. I just want to say thank you for, first of all, to wonderful students of Pratt for setting up this event and to have these voices heard in my school is so important. I'm incredibly grateful that we're recording this, actually, because I think that many of my faculty need to listen to this if they couldn't attend this evening. And my question was really around what you would all really recommend to be a kind of transitional pedagogy. I've just defined it, I suppose, in my in my question in the chat as a repatriation pedagogy. But of course, that's one element of the many topics that you've discussed tonight. And I think it's really important for us to listen to what you have to say about what that pedagogy could look like. We have, um, since I arrived at Pratt, we've obviously done quite a lot of work or tried to at least around issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging perhaps to, um, but there's certainly a, a very important question for us around what constitutes curriculum, uh, because I think, you know, we, we're not under any illusions that in a way, anything that's constructed around imperialist values that have been configured to create um, extraordinary wealth for a minority and extraordinary poverty for the rest of us, um, embedded in that infrastructure is education systems, which of course, historically have been designed to serve um, very limited notions of what constitutes knowledge and what constitutes expertise. And this is why I think it's incredibly important to have these conversations, to invite you to define what you think curriculum should focus on and what a, a meaningful and responsive and repatriative pedagogy could look like. So that's a very long way of asking my question. Um, do forgive me, but I'm very interested in your answers. Thank you. I'll give that um, the thought it deserves and reply to Jared um, in an email. Thank you, that's wonderful. On, on my end, um, what I can offer right now intuitively, because I also believe that it definitely is a a lofty question. I think there's there's a lot to take into consideration. I think that the systems that, you know, the ideology of just like the pyramid analysis, for example, or just finding ways to have a more revolved, integrated um, way of 
creating curriculum. I think that also include inclusion of um, the, vo the voices, because I find that a lot of people don't have the space. Like I normally don't have the opportunity to speak um, and have an audience in this way. I really don't have that opportunity often. So I feel like maybe finding um, some of the, lo the people locally or just other people, depending on what the, you know, what area of focus it's, it is, but finding people in that area who, whose voices need to be amplified. I think that that would be an, a, a great approach. Thank you, that's great. Um, Kofi, no, I, if, would you like to? Just, yeah, just briefly, I think that um, uh, the education and curriculum exa exist in a, in a bigger ecosystem. And one thing that, uh, at least in this century, climate change is sort of teaching us is that the laying we used to feel comfortable occupying in terms of professional skill sets to get licensed to then work for a firm is really narrow and that we need people who are really great thinkers uh, and really creative people everywhere. And so it's one thing to talk about curriculum, but you're graduating people out of a program with an expectation that they'll have a technical skill set that will allow them to get licensed, that will allow them to make a living making structures. And so curriculum exists in a bigger model. So I think part of it is uh, dismantling the notion of the track, the traditional track. There are gonna be people who are always gonna be doing that. And then you're at the purview of say firms or communities or other clients. It's a fee for service business in a lot of different ways that don't share your values. So that's a harsh thing to say, but the idea is that there might be opportunities to think about a different kind of ecosystem that creates a different kind of demand that values people who have a decolonial way of thinking about design. And part of it, I think, is the exposure. Uh, as instructors, myself and landscape architecture and others, we have a lot of power in terms of what we choose to expose our students to, who we choose to expose our students to, how we choose to expose them, the kind of experiences that we have. So even without the massive step of rethinking it. There are a lot of things we can do right now to expose people to a broader range of what being a great designer or a great architect can be, what you can do. It may not always be going to a coffee table book, AIA winning award firm, and maybe that's okay. Maybe it is applying those skills in new territory, new ground or old ground, recovering old ground that was lost. So that was one of the impetus of this Black Landscape Matters article was to say that landscape architecture relegated to making people's yards beautiful, uh, planting flowers and that sort of thing is fine. But as long as you think that that's all it is, then that's all you think the possibilities are. Can you open up the range of possibilities and see yourself doing amazing uh, groundbreaking work? Uh, are there people that you can aspire to become? Are there lessons you can learn from great places that aren't in the typical canon of what we talk about? So even before we start to think about major uh, uh, changes to curriculum, I think there's an ecosystem analysis of thinking through where people wanna go, where they wanna take the great skill sets that we're providing with people, how they wanna apply them, how they respect people, how they respect the earth. So there's, there's, there's bundles of, of things that are tied into that. And I think that curriculum is a piece, but I'm not even sure if it's the most important piece to it. Kofi, thank you. I'm so grateful. You're all offering such detailed replies. It's incredible. I wish I, was, I should be taking notes immediately. Thank you. Um, again, thank, thank you guys for those amazing answers. And I look forward to reading uh, what you said, Robin. Um, to go to another student question, um, how can we maximize public space's role as an asset for everyone? How can And how can we activate current inadequate and underutilized public spaces? Um, I would love to speak on that in the context of um, community gardens and a lot of other community spaces that aren't 
organized or they don't actually function like a community. Like I'm sure many people have gone to some gardens before and it's like everyone has their own bed and or people pay for like it just doesn't actually function as a community. So um, I think that that's a really important thing to look at as far as how to design, um, you know, the actual infrastructure for how the space is going to be managed and how decisions are gonna be made and looking at things like um, consensus, which is a really powerful, um, you know, African centered perspective, one of many, but I think it's one that is very important because nobody loses in it. And I think that it's really important because people have to, you know, meet each other and agree to a certain degree. So I think that that's a, a huge, um, a huge shift from even the, you know, democratic, you know, like taking things to a vote, which might be efficient, but it's not necessarily um, something that, you know, leaves all parties <laughs> satisfied and it's, doesn't, it's not as communal. Um, so that's another suggestion as well. Um, for our community garden, we make all decisions together. Um, and, you know, sometimes things take a little longer, but it's also about just, you know, being on nature's pace and not on the pace of capitalism because we're not machines. So I think that that's an important aspect as well. Thank you. Hey. I mean, just briefly, I would say, uh, again, as designers, we're in some cases trained to think that we can make something that almost irrespective of who shows up or what's happening or what the politics or economics are, that it'll work. And I think uh, there is no public space that's welcoming to everybody anywhere, but there is human agency. And so what I would suggest is to consider uh, the programming and the governance as was just talked about with the community gardens that can extend to a lot of different places is if there is a conflict, if there is something that's uh, producing a challenge, what is the process of resolving that or addressing that or fixing it? And I think we don't pay enough attention to the human capital component of public space. We wanna make the physical infrastructure and sort of let it do its thing. But how you program it, how you maintain it, uh, how you decide when things go awry is really critical. And I think that uh, that's something that's worth exploring. And there are a lot of people, particularly in New York City, who've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Oh, shit. okay. Um, thank you. Um, to move, we got about 10 minutes left. I'll leave a little time to close. But um, towards the last few questions, um this one was interesting can individuals and groups take action towards repairing generational wounds and start addressing reparations how would we go about doing this and is there any best way to do this to then instigate positive institutional action I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Could you repeat the first part of the question? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it and also um, put it in the chat so you can read it. Um, can individuals and groups take action towards repairing generational wounds and start addressing reparations? How would we go about doing this? And is there any best way to do this to instigate positive institutional action? Absolutely, and it must happen that way. So it is the injured community that should uh, work together to determine um, the harm and the remedy. And in our community and others, it's happening with stakeholder convened groups and leadership boards that are deciding on what priorities um, and how they would like to prioritize uh, redress. And in that work, there is community work that has to happen amongst the stakeholder community itself, um, a lot of learning, but then in solidarity by consensus, as was mentioned, um, those recommendations can be taken with demands to the institutions. And that's the model uh, that we've used 
um, in Evanston. And it's the model that I'm hoping other communities that are looking to do reparations are hearing the state, the, the black community, the injured community, they're hearing their demands and their priorities and looking as that as their um, action plan to implement some sort of uh, legislative um, action. Thank you. And I, I think that also um, looking at some of the ways some people are already doing that. Um, I know Robin, you mentioned that, you know, some people were saying like, oh, that's not really reparations. And it's like, we have to really take one step at a time. Like we're not gonna get everything. Like we really can't even quantify what needs to be repaired. And it's like, it's not real, you know, just the reality of like the gravity of the situation. But there are people who are taking some creative approaches. I think that, you know, there's people who are literally just sending people money, <laughs> you know, like that that's, says a lot because a lot of the finances and the capital that people have are based off of everything that we've discussed. Um, I think that the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is one I'm familiar with, and they're doing a lot of work on reparations and, um, and I think they have a, a couple of different initiatives and programs, but actually supporting organizations and institutions that need it. You know, Tuhuti Ma'a is literally entirely volunteer run. We've, we've never had a budget really. We do fundraising for, you know, organic food for the people, which still has like 9,000, it has 1,000 plus dollars and it's like a $10,000, $11,000 um, budget that we put on for the fundraiser page. Um, you know, and we don't even have an operational budget. So that's all things that we're working on. Um, and it's not sustainable, right? It's not, it's not sustainable. And there are a lot of grassroots organizations that have that issue. And I think really focusing on the grassroots is one way as an individual, if you have the resources to do so, maybe the resources are technical skills. Maybe you can design flyers. Maybe you can like, you know, there's so many different things that people need. Um, and then I also want to mention the reparations map that um, that exists. And I'm trying to remember the name of the organization, but I, I've received it in the Soul Fire Farm. Um, it's an extension of the Soul Fire Farm Network, um, but it's a reparations map where there are people who are giving land, returning land to people to as an act of reparations as well. So I think we do need you know, institutional reparations. And I think we need to be practical about it, but also creative. Um, okay, to, I had a question from a uh, guy who I don't want to mispronounce. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, all right. You talking about me? Yeah. All right. So I had a question for you, Neff. Um, well, any of you guys can answer, but so Robin said it's important to keep our dollar in our community. With that being said, Neff, would you say growing your own food, which in a way can be looked at as growing money, can be looked at as a revolutionary act in keeping the dollar in our community? Thank you for that question. Absolutely. I think that we should really be rethinking currency. One of the concepts we've come up with through Organic Food for the People and Tuhudi Ma'a Garden is the seeds currency system, which seeds are going to be the currency of the future because they have value and they can and they are efficient to, to trade. And um, I think those are things we really have to think about. But also you're keeping the dollar in because the less it has to, the less you have to um, trade or exchange outside of your community, the more you're creating value within your community. So it's about producing. I think that that's really an important factor that we have to um, think about because in order to shift the dynamic, we really have to radically shift the, the, the scales because we are consuming way more than we need to and we're not producing nearly enough 
So I think beyond food, there are many things. Produce matches, produce toilet paper, produce all the things that we need. I think Robin mentioned just like the void of services and things that we actually need. So people do need to get in that creative, productive space. Um, but also there's the reality of the capital that's necessary in order to do that. So it's all interconnected, but yes. Thank you. Um, I, I have uh, just a question to wrap up, perhaps. Um, uh, one of the things that I believe that when Jared and I were talking about uh, doing the talk was that, oh, uh, so who do we want to talk about? And I think it came up in all three of your talks very interestingly, and I was very excited about it, was the interdisciplinary nature of all your work. That, uh, hey, can we get a lawmaker, an artist, and an architect to have a conversation about the same thing? and get different perspectives. And I'm very, very, I'm so humbled and very, very glad that we were able to see that today. Um, what is your advice for uh, students here at Pratt to actually start engaging in that interdisciplinary nature of, your, of the work that you are doing as, uh, as I would say, like as uh, Neff mentioned, the, to, take, to sort of step onto your, the shoulders of, your, of your, the ones who've come before you and sort of then follow their lead. So what would you advise us to follow your lead? I'm, I'm really grateful that you asked the question because um, you are needed, all of you are needed. And Neff really spoke to it well in that um, contributing to the work in like intellect, in your intellectual capacity and also in your um, technical assistance. So, in Evanston, and I speak about Evanston a lot because we're practicing this now, um, financial support is one thing, but the social capital and the relationships that we've received from others that can help us build our legal capacity, help us with um, branding and marketing, help us um, strengthen an impact study, researchers. Um, so those are ways that you can support this type of work that's happening in your own cities and in your own neighborhoods and even inspire those local leaders that don't have the staff or the, um, the team that they need to advance the work, they can be empowered by your support and your technical assistance and your um, intellectual contributions as well. And then stop studying it. So that's been my frustration with um, academics is like, how many new versions of a study do we need? Um, we have done that. And the data is clear. The history is not up for debate. Like let's just, how imperfect it might be and clumsy and cumbersome and whatever, like let's begin to move beyond theory into practice. And so I would encourage you all to be bold and move into the practice of things that we've studied for so long. Well said, Robin. <laughs> um, I will say that um, I actually just finished designing a page on tehutimaat.org that says join. We have um, created this model, which we've had since, because we've been operating for about seven years, um, just doing this community service work um, across the range, the book clubs, all kinds of different things. And Really, the Tehutima militia is what the, the organized force of support that we want to create in order to like bring this energy forward. Because like I said, it's bigger than the, inst the instrument itself. It's more so about the energy. And, um, you know, there are different ways depending on like where we're actually unapologetically and radically exclusive in terms of like collaborating and, and working in the inner um, sanctum. However, we've created a way where we can do energy exchanges for people who don't want to do financial contributions on that page. You could also just share your skill, your interest, um, and we'll engage with you in that way. But um, that's our strategy that we're just putting forward now to create an operational budget um, as a way to have like reoccurring support. Um, and on the kingdom level, it's pretty much at any level that you are able to con contribute. And it just shows a commitment with consistency, even if it's a dollar. 
just want to also direct people to that as a way to support the work that we're doing. You can see some specific things need to be updated, but there's some specific things on there as well. If you want to just support organic food for the people. Thank you. Yeah, I think that um, it was all great advice. Um, I would add that interdisciplinary work is hard because we don't all speak the same language. So you have to kind of get to know people and build relationships and build trust so you can work together. And sometimes that takes time. Sometimes it's out of the scope of the time frame of a student project or even a professional project, but that investment is worth it. Because uh, when you can communicate with one another, you know, you can, you can work together. Um, and I also think setting mutual expectations is really important. I think that as designers, kind of trained in a utopian kind of style that whatever we do is better than what they had and designers have done a lot of damage uh, thinking that way. So almost everything that uh, particularly was presented regarding redlining and urban renewal, freeway construction, those were designers that thought that stuff. They thought they were doing the right thing. They were doing the wrong thing. So not to assume that you're coming in as neutral, assume that you're coming in as in some cases being a part of that entity that that caused harm in the past and so part of it is a bit of humility um, but also part of it is being clear about expectations that every experience i've had that's been great with communities haven't always resulted in the same place but it was good because everyone got out early what their expectations were themselves and were one another uh, and then you kind of proceed we skip that step often because we reduce it to the scoping for a project so also be kindness in a time. A lot of the issues that were talked about in this discussion aren't gonna be solved in a day or a minute or a week or a year. So it's, it's an investment, it's time, it's a life mission. So just be kindness in a time, it operates differently than we're trained to th think in school. Thank you so much, all three of you. And that is just about a wrap on our time. Uh, I put some links in the chat um, if you want to keep updated with some Pratt Futures and other Pratt uh, lectures, as well as the YouTube page that this will be on afterwards. Um, I just want to extend gratitude and thanks to everyone um, for coming. An event is nothing if people are speaking to avoid. I want to thank the speakers for sharing with us some knowledge collected over time and um if uh if you guys would like to have any last words please do and with that i'll say thanks everyone i just want to thank you all um thank you for the invitation and thank you for everyone present but especially thank you to robin and kofi for your work and the inspiration that i feel from what you've shared so thank you Echoing in the thanks and um, Neff, if this is the first time I was able to grant permission, so it was nice to be an elder for the first time. <laughs> um, other than that, um, thank you all that are watching and participating. I hope that you do take action, whatever action is appropriate. Um, to, to the point of the professor, it, it can't always be done in an ac academic calendar, but there is there is work and actions that can take place and you can contact grassroots organizations support them in building capacity and do whatever you can, but thank you for your willingness. Yeah, just a thank you to everybody on the panel and the audience moderator. Thank you to the students for organizing. We appreciate it. All right, and I'll see everyone at the next event. Bye.